welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and Jerry's over there. The gang's all here, which means that it's time for Stuff You Should Know. So settle down, everybody. Be quiet. Yeah, the uh, Hotel Fire Edition, which will not be chock full of laughs, probably. No. No, it really won't. Um, I don't know what it is about hotel fires that always fascinated me, but they did. I think it was the... 1980 MGM Grand Fire that got me. Oh, yeah? Um, yeah, but there's just something extra creepy about a hotel fire to me. Um, and it turns out that there are there have been some some big ones and some bad ones. And th- in this one particular year, enough of them happened that America finally got off its duff and started doing something about it. Yeah, and also while reading this, I was, uh, was kind of thinking – like, why weren't there a dozen more of these that year or in any surrounding year mm-hmm. when you look at how, mm-hmm. uh, well, how unsafe things were and how, you know, I know people complain about the government regulating things. But yeah, sometimes it's nice to say you should have fire sprinklers and fire alarms or you can't do business. Yeah, that's a really good point. And this is a great example of that. You're right. It's also a great example of how people smoking can used to be able to just kill dozens or scores of people by falling asleep with a cigarette or tossing it somewhere or something stupid, you know? Yeah, I mean, one of these hotels had, uh, and we'll get into the nitty-gritty of the just how flammable these places were mm-hmm. back then. And it's amazing the uh, steps that they've taken over the years to make things uh, safer. But I think one of these places had like seven layers of wallpaper upon wallpaper, mm-hmm. which were all highly, highly flammable. Yeah. Like they were burlap you- walls sometimes, like stuff that just, if you look at it wrong, it'll catch fire. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like, what'd you just say? Yeah. I'm catching fire. They were using Firebug Special brand wallpaper. It was really? that bad. No. <laughs> It wouldn't surprise me. Well, of course, they wouldn't do that. But everything, I don't know. It was just, everything was really flammable, it seemed like. Flammable, dangerous. Pajamas were very flammable. Just everything was flammable back then, way more than these days. All the things you smoke in. Right. Smoking jackets were flammable. Yeah. Cigarettes, flammable. <laughs> so this this one year, so there were tons and tons of hotel fires. Like the, it, was a, it was a thing. Um but in 1946, it just got particularly bad. And it was yeah. just coincidence. There wasn't anything really that connected these fires. But there were a handful of hotel fires that year that uh, happened quickly enough and were big enough or, or happened um, close enough to one another, I should say. And then were big enough, had enough of a, a casualties and in, in, um, deaths from them that, that it, it caught the attention of the public. And, and something was finally done. And it was 1946 when it happened. And the first one was in June. Yes, uh, June 5th in Chicago, Illinois, the mm-hmm. LaSalle Hotel. Uh, so here's how this one went down. There was uh, It was after the, the school year had ended, so this hotel was really packed. Um, a lot of families would, and still do, uh, if you live in, in the suburbs or rural areas, would flood into the city mm-hmm. after the school year. They bring their kids. They go shopping. They go to the zoo. They do city things uh, as, you know, sort of like a post-school vacation. And so all of this hotel uh, was full. 1,000 rooms apparently were fully occupied. Mm-hmm. And uh, like so many of these, they started late at night. Yeah, and the cocktail lounge, the Silver Grill Cocktail Lounge on the ground floor of the LaSalle. And the cocktail wait staff had a longstanding method of disposing of cigarette butts at the end of the night from all the ashtrays. When they empty the ashtrays, they just dump them in a cardboard box that they kept in a closet behind the bar. Yeah, I thought you were going to say they had a way of getting people out of the bar, which they was to set crank it on fire. Uh, <laughs> no, usually you crank... Uh, What's that really bad band that everyone hates? 
38 special. Oh, no. That's the one everyone loves. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> now, who's the Canadian band that everyone makes fun of all the time? Uh, Nickelback. Rush. No. No, you, Nickelback. You cranked I know. Nickel, I thought you were going to say they cranked Nickelback. No. That, although, I don't know what that would have done to people in 1946. Yeah, their minds might have been blown. <laughs> Maybe they were so. a band out of time and place. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... They didn't. They didn't um, blare any Nickelback. Everybody just left on their own accord. But after they left this box of smoldering cigarette butts, cardboard box of smoldering cigarette butts in a closet, crazy in one of the world's most flammable hotels, um, caught like their luck ran out. I can't believe that it didn't happen sooner. But that's what happened. This um, somebody I think smelled smoke, and very quickly after that, um, they saw a little bit of flames coming from uh, beneath the paneling yeah around the wall yeah, right not, one not of the a good walls sign. no but th- here is where mistake number 2 comes in chuck and this is a recurring theme too with these hotel fires um everyone said we got this and some drunken uh, people went and grabbed a seltzer bottle and started to try to put the fire out themselves yeah i mean it's hard to or, or rather it's easy to cast stones in the year 2018. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I imagine if I was hammered at a bar at 2.20 in the morning and I saw a little smoke and a little flame, mm-hmm. my first reaction would probably be like, man, let's extinguish this real quick and not let me run and call the fire department. But that's exactly what you should always do is run and call the fire department. Yeah, that's that's I mean, that's what I learned from researching this is that's the implication. Just don't don't assume that you can handle any fire. Yeah. That's what the fire department is there for. Yep. They're more than happy to come out to your call and um, deal with it. And you don't have to be embarrassed if it was just a little fire. Sure, they'll make fun of you, but it'll be behind your back. Yeah, but this one was especially egregious because apparently from that moment that they saw those flames and smelled the smoke, it took about 15 minutes before anybody called the fire department, apparently because they were – arguing over, or concerned at least, over who had the authority in the hotel to call the fire department, which yep. I don't get. There was a protocol. Like, you had to be of a certain level of management, I believe, to to officially call in a fire call to the fire department. See, that's LaSalle. nuts to me. Yeah, I think anybody who sees a flame should be qualified to call the fire department, right? Yeah. But that was a huge, huge delay. Fifteen minutes in this place, as you'll see, um, was a big deal. And That's one all of the that reasons, mattered. That's what, all it took, rather. That 15 minutes? Yeah, to like, it, it was done after that. Yeah, and they figured out pretty quickly when they ran to, to um, tell the manager that it was on fire. It, after they tried that seltzer bottle thing, um, I think the flames just went, whoop, and they start, they all ran away because they saw that this was, this was bad. And then there was another 15 minutes on top of that. And in the meantime, this LaSalle's Cocktail Lounge and actually a lot of the lobby had just been redone in this nicely veneered wood yeah. um, and everything flammable that they could possibly come up with. And so that 15 minutes was very substantial in letting this fire really get going. Yeah, they said, hey, we have this great new uh, bar and lounge, but we need to ventilate it because everyone's smoking. So we're going to cut a hole in the elevator shaft. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden you have a chimney, mm-hmm. and that'll be a common thread here is just uh, how many big open areas, whether it be a transom window above the room doors yep. uh, being open, which happened a lot back then because there wasn't air conditioning in these buildings. Yeah, it's a big point. Uh, it just really exacerbates a, a fire once it gets going. Yeah, and with the LaSalle in particular, the fact that they had cut a hole, an air hole from the place where the fire started into a central open shaft going up into the hotel. <laughs> um, that's one thing. But leading into this this um, elevator shaft, there were also air holes on every floor because these fire doors that were supposed to close off each floor from the central stairwell had been propped open to allow air to flow through better. Right. And then, like you said, there were windows above the doors that were open a little bit the transoms, and that was letting in air from the outside into the hotel itself. So the flames and the smoke and the fumes were able to just rise that much more quickly because of the series of little tiny decisions that individual people had made that all came together to turn this thing into a conflagration. 
Yeah, and I, I, I'm not sure if it was the LaSalle or one of the other ones, but they, they all seem to have transoms, and they all seem to make a big difference Yeah, uh, because they were largely open. Because one of them, uh, they found in the rooms where the transoms were closed, the fire damage wasn't so bad, but in the ones where they were open, they were just, you know, gutted. Right. So there was um, a few things that happened, right? As this fire is getting really bad, um, the fire department starts to show up, and ultimately 300 firefighters from 61 companies showed up to this fire to fight it, which is just a, an enormous amount, even for back then, or especially for back then. Um, and they're not just firefighters, they're actually people at the hotel who were working to save lives. In particular, Chuck, there was a switchboard operator at the hotel who stayed on to call individual rooms because this fire started after midnight. So most of the people in the hotel were in, in their rooms asleep. Mm-hmm. So this operator was calling every room and saying, there's a fire, get out of the hotel and hang up and call the next one. And she actually died in the fire because she stayed on to call as many rooms as possible. And the fact that more people didn't die out of more than a thousand people, ultimately 61 died. You can basically attribute to this this lady's heroism for staying on and giving her life to to tell as many people as as possible that there was a fire in the hotel. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, and she had to do that because there was no alarm system. Yeah. So not even a bell ringing out. Uh, I think he said 300 firefighters uh, in 1946. Only three of these fire units in the entire city had two way radios. So the word couldn't get around fast enough. Uh, in the end, they got about 60 um, units there. But by that time, it was just too little too late. But the fact, like you said, I mean, this had more guests than any of the other hotels staying there. And the fact that only 61 people died out of the 1,000 is, uh, is pretty amazing. Yeah. There, there was also another pair of heroes who were, I think, sailors. Um, they rescued 27 people between the two of them. They just kept running back into the hotel and dragging people out. Amazing. Yeah, it is amazing what like something like that does to people, to some people. It brings out just amazing stuff in them, you know? Yeah, so two weeks later, uh, on June 19th, I mean, America was still sort of recovering from this news. Uh, 19 people died at the Hotel Canfield in mm-hmm. Dubuque, Iowa. And it really was eerily similar. Like, it seemed like none of these buildings had sprinklers or alarms. Yeah, They were all highly combustible. They all had these big open staircases. And the fire doors uh, were open. Right. And an open fire door is not a fire door. No, and I mean, like, they had, like, good fire doors. But if it's open, yeah, it's it's just a, a really easy place for smoke and fire and air to feed the fire to just move through. Um and the, at the uh, at the Canfield, I think that I think they had built onto the hotel. The, the hotel, uh, and you said this is in Dubuque, Iowa, right? Yeah. They had originally built the hotel in 1891, and then added on. And the news the news section was doing fairly well, but when the um, when the uh, the old section, which is where the cocktail lounge was, mm-hmm. where the fire started again, um, the uh, when that burned, like that burned substantially, they had to tear it down afterward. And I have to correct myself. Uh, I made fun of the LaSalle's wait staff for um, putting the cigarette butts into a box. Yeah. No one, no one in Chicago would do something that careless. <laughs> you would have to live in Dubuque to do something that careless because it was actually at the Canfield where that fire was started like that. Yeah, there was a, an employee who opened that little closet uh uh, also known as the cigarette dumping room, I guess, <laughs> at the back of the lounge. Um, the, by this time, the, the bar had emptied out, and uh, this this kid, you know, again, doesn't call immediately the fire department. He runs to find the, the manager, which, you know, a kid working there again, I don't, that may have been protocol, but you're, you're probably trained to go tell the manager of any anything like that. And one William Canfield was the manager. He uh, actually didn't call right away either. He ran to get a fire extinguisher, Yeah. ran back there. Everything was fully on fire. He went humana, humana, humana. Yeah, at that point, he knew what was going on. And, uh, you know, some of these people burned to death. Many of them on the upper floors uh, were asphyxiated by smoke. Yeah. And another recurring thing that you'll see is people 
uh, jumping into nets or climbing down uh, sheets tied together or fire escapes. Mm -hmm. Some of them made it. Some of them didn't. Yeah, I think a lot of the ones who tied their bed sheets into ropes and, and shimmied down actually did make it. Um, but I think ultimately there were um, 30 people who were rescued jumping into nets. 27 were carried down by ladders. Um, and there were 100 guests that managed to escape. I think the total number of guests uh, who died were 19. 19 people died. So again, it could have been a lot worse. If the fire department hadn't have gotten as many people out or as many people hadn't have, like, you know, made their own ropes to shimmy down. Yeah. But again, this was like less than two weeks after the fire in Chicago. And two days, Chuck, again, this is making national news, these huge fires, right? Yeah. People stayed in hotels. It was like a big deal if if a, a, a lot of people died in a hotel fire. Two days after the Canfield Hotel in Dubuque, in Ju- on June 21st, 1946, there was another fire, and this one w- was in Dallas at the Baker Hotel. Yeah, and this one seems to be uh, like the hot shot place to be, the luxury hotel in the city. Uh, not only did it host people from out, like, you know, highfalutin people from out of town, mm-hmm. but they had several, you know, well-to-do restaurants and ballrooms and things. So many locals uh, hung out here as well, like... Uh, like the big bands and the swing bands of the 20s and 30s would play here. But they were forced to wear Stetson hats when they did. <laughs> Probably so. This was local custom. Uh, and this was a gas explosion at this one. Um, so it wasn't the fault of someone dumping cigarette butts or anything like that. Right. Uh, and 10 people ended up dying in this one, injured over 40. And the only reason that this one seemed to have a um, – they, they got away uh, lighter lighter with the death count was – that it was in a Mm sub-basement, and it never fully, like, went through the rest of the hotel. Right. But again, this is so three fires in the month of June 1946 claimed the lives of 90 people, one right after the other. And this has America's attention, right? But really, the whole thing just kind of set the stage for what would be the worst hotel fire in the history of the United States um, that would come in December. And we'll take a break and we'll get to the Weinkauf Hotel fire after this. So we're in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, right. That's Literally. Great. Yes. And in the Wayback Machine. Okay. Because this happened in Atlanta, and we briefly mentioned this in one episode a while back and said, hey, we should do an episode on that. Did we? Uh-huh. I can't remember why. Huh. But we mentioned it, and um, or maybe it was a listener mail or something, but here we are making good for once. On a promise. Yeah, not even <laughs> remembering that we'd made the promise. Just stumbling backwards into fulfilling that promise. It may have been skyscrapers because the, the Weinkauf Hotel in Atlanta was 15 stories high. And when uh-huh. it was built in 1913, it was one of – it was considered a skyscraper and one of Atlanta's first. Right. Um, yeah, 15 stories in 1913, that's nothing to sneeze at, especially in Atlanta too, right? Yeah, is there a website converter for how many stories that would be today? <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> it's 50,000 Big Macs tall. Oh, okay. Um, so the, uh, the, the wine cough is actually still around today. It's called the Ellis Hotel yeah. now, down by um, Phillips Arena downtown. Um, and back in 1946, like you said, it was a, it was a pretty swank hotel in the uh, Atlanta area. Um, and this was in December, December 7th. That was the fifth anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And there were a pretty decent amount of people staying in the wine cough that night. I think, um, how many? Was it a 1,000? No, a couple hundred. I'm sorry. It was a 1,000 who were in the LaSalle. But there was, um, I think, 300 people staying in the wine cough, people from out of town, a lot of them from out of town, 
people who were shopping for Christmas. There was a contingent of high school kids from Rome who were uh, Rome, Georgia, I should right. say. <laughs> yeah, much different than the, the other Rome. <laughs> who were um, part of the Tri High Y, which is a Christian group. And they had come because they were going to be uh, take place in a mock legislature. And then um, there were a lot of vets returning from World War II. There were just a lot of people hanging out in the wine cough that night. Yeah, and this one, we should point out, uh, this, like so many buildings and especially hotels at the time, were advertised as fireproof. Um, obviously, pre-1946 even, fires were a problem, and it was probably on people's minds. So they started things like the unsinkable Titanic and fireproof buildings. Like, things were being touted as safe and somewhat indestructible. But but by this time, Chuck, I would have been like, well, I'm staying away from that because <laughs> that's it's, basically yeah. tempting fate, apparently. Because <laughs> when you yeah. call something unsinkable or fireproof, it burns to the ground or sinks. Yeah, but here's the thing. The outside was fireproof. <laughs> okay. So that there was, I guess, there was some fine print there because, as you said, the Ellis Hotel still stands and at, at the end of this horrible fire, which we're going to detail, uh, the outside was still okay. It was the inside where all the people and stuff are mm-hmm. that matters and was not fireproof at all. Right. So this one, the Weinkauf Hotel fire, again, it's the worst hotel fire in the United States history. Hopefully it stays that way forever. Um, but it was started by a mystery. They still are not entirely sure what happened. But at about 3 a.m. on uh, December 7th, 1946, uh, somebody, no, I'm sorry, it was the elevator operator who was traveling up and down the elevator, just doing her thing. And around the fifth floor, she noticed that she smelled smoke. So she bolts all the way down to the ground floor and runs out in the lobby and starts shouting fire. And that kicks off a series of events that um, well, they're pretty substantial. Yeah, and keep in mind, this fireproof hotel, not only did it have no sprinkler system and yeah. no alarm system like seemingly every other building, yeah. there were no fire doors and no fire escapes. So it seemed especially fire-prone, <clears throat> not fireproof at all. But I wonder if they were saying, we don't even need that stuff because this building's fireproof. Maybe, but boy, I mean, they didn't think that through at all because— no. uh, yeah, like I said, what's on the inside counts. If the inside is on fire, it doesn't matter if, like, well, the brick's still solid, guys. Right. You know? It's still standing. The structure is. All right, so there are a couple of theories as to how this one started. Um, there were a group of uh, dudes there playing poker, mm-hmm. um, just met up in a room to play a game of poker or play poker all night, and they were on the third floor. Some people say that it started with a mattress in the hallway outside their suite, So someone that was uh, in this game got ticked off, uh, left the room, and set this mattress on fire on purpose. Yes. It's one theory. A man named Roy McCullough, who was an ex-con and then a con again later on, who um, had allegedly seen a guy who ratted him out in prison and that he'd set the fire after he left the poker game because he was trying to kill the guy and ended up killing 119 people. That's actually the position of a pair of journalists um, named Sam Hayes and Alan Goodwin, who wrote The Weinkauf Fire, a book. They very squarely placed the whole thing on Roy McCullough's shoulders. Yeah, but that is just a theory because other people, and the mayor of Atlanta, Mayor Hartsfield, uh, at the time did invite fire experts in to to look it over. Mm -hmm. And I think they kind of roundly agreed that it was not some mattress set on fire deliberately uh, because people smelled like burning gas or tires or some weird uh, specific smoke spell, uh, mm-hmm. smoke smell. Mm-hmm. And they thought that there was an accelerant and it was in another part of the hotel. It wasn't near the mattress at all. And uh, so that would explain why, you know, the stairway went up so quickly. Well, that yeah, and that was the official Atlanta Fire Department's position that it somebody had carelessly tossed a cigarette somewhere around the fourth floor stairwell and it had gone up. Which, I mean, if that's all it takes for your hotel to go up, that's pretty bad, too, you know? Yeah, and the Weinkauf, I believe, that was the one where it had the stairwell going up around the elevator shaft, right? 
Yes. So we have to talk about this for a second. They added a central elevator shaft, which again can act very easily like a chimney. Um, and the one, the one single way up or down was an, a, a staircase that went around the elevator shaft. Yeah. So when the elevator shaft is filled with hot gases and smoke, so too is the staircase, which meant that when the the um, bottom floors, starting around the, I think the third or fourth f- or fifth floor, started to catch fire and po- smoke started pouring out, it went up and everybody above those floors was trapped in the hotel, up to 15 floors. And when the fire department came out, they realized very quickly, and I'm sure they already knew this, the highest that they had a ladder, uh, the highest ladder they had could go up to 85 feet. Well, that's about eight stories. This is a 15-story building. So the people in the higher stories were really in trouble. Yeah, and inside this hotel, too, there was a lot of poor design going on. There were um, there were a lot of hidden voids. There were false ceilings. There were places where the fire could be spreading and no one even knows it's spreading. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, these open lobbies and mezzanines, open stairways. The transoms really came into play again with people just getting fresh air into their rooms. Uh, even though they, they do mention air conditioning in the wine cough, but it was December. But it is Atlanta. Yeah, I'm not sure why either because, I mean, I can understand why somebody would open the window to, to stick their head out. But, yeah, since it's cold, the the transom should be shut. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe fresh the, air. Yeah, maybe the room was stuffy or something like that. Well, everyone was smoking, so maybe they just wanted to let out some of their cigarette smoke. <laughs> right. Or they ran out of smoke, so they were letting everybody else's smoke in. That's a good point. Uh, Is it? Sure. Okay. Should we take another break? (laughs) Yeah. All right. We'll talk about um, how most people perished and what was done about this right after this. So the wine cough, uh, I mean, in all these hotels, people tried to escape through fire escapes and stuff because they had them. The The wine cough did not have fire escapes, like we said. So there were a lot of people um, tying bed sheets. They were trying to jump onto nets held by firefighters. They were trying to leap onto adjacent buildings mm-hmm. from lower floors. Uh, and some people just, you know... You you jump because you think that's your best bet, uh, and some of those people actually survived. Many of them died. Uh, one very sad story was one person jumped and actually survived because they landed on bodies of people that had died below them. Yeah, it's really tough um, to get across what the what the scene, how chaotic this scene was. Like there were bodies just falling everywhere. The the firefighters had nets. But people were jumping in totally uncoordinated ways. And so very frequently there were so many people coming down that they didn't have enough nets for them all. So they had to basically pick who to try to catch with their net. Um, There was a guy named uh, Jimmy Cahill, I believe. He was from Albany, Georgia. And he was a hero of the, the Weinkauf fire because he escaped and ran next door to a building that sh- that shared a, an alley between it and the Weinkauf and found uh, like some painter scaffolding, like just like a, a stout board and put it between the building next door that he'd run to and the room where his mother was trapped on the sixth floor of the Weinkauf and got her out. And started getting other people out, too. And other people, including the fire department, started laying ladders down and getting people out this way. So a lot of people escaped from going from the wine cough to the building next door. But other people, even climbing across this 10-foot alley to the next building to safety, were getting knocked off of the ladders by people who were jumping from higher buildings. Like, just total chaos. Smoke everywhere. People screaming. Um, just, Just chaos, man. I can't whenever my mind kind of like imagines what that must have been yeah. like, it just kind of snaps back to the present time as quick as possible. It's just tough to, to conceive of. Yeah. A numbers wise, um, man, this is just awful. 48 people were literally burned alive. 
Uh, 40 people were asphyxiated by smoke and fumes. Mm -hmm. 31 people died from jumping uh, or falling or being knocked off or shoved or whatever. And uh, that's the total number. What was it? 119 total? Yeah. Yeah. And then 39 of those 119 people were under 20. Um, and I think a lot of them were those kids there for the for the mock uh, delegation or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's super, super sad. And, you know, the good news is out of all of this is it's sad that it took this. But after this spate of fires, the government finally was like, we've got to do something here because people are just – it seems like left and right dying in hotel fires. Yeah. And um, what's sad is there were people who had already been writing all of these recommendations of like best practices. There's a, um, the uh, life safety code from the national fire protection association had basically been saying like, here's, here's what you got to do. It's not like we didn't know how to prevent losses of life and hotel fires. It's just that people weren't, making hotel operators do these things. And so these fire policies stayed local, right? So there's it's still, to this day, a patchwork of regulations in a lot of ways. But they're, they, these little towns and cities were so affected by these fires in 1946 that they started adopting these policies, including things like, you got a hotel, you got to have a fire sprinkler system. That was one. A fire alarm system, I mean, really low-hanging fruit. But that a lot of hotels just didn't have at the time. Suddenly, they were forced to. Yeah, fire doors um, were required then uh, pretty much everywhere. They were required to be closed at all times. Mm -hmm. uh, those transoms, those troublesome transoms that admittedly I think are great and love, um, they were uh, basically prohibited from that point on. Uh, you know, fresh air, air conditioning or no, they said no more transoms. Right. Uh, and then fire escapes, of course, were mandated pretty much everywhere. Yeah, and if you um, if you look around, like if you're in a, an office building or something, you ever go down the stairwell, like it's totally unadorned. It's concrete and metal, and it's painted. There's nothing. There's no art. There's no carpet. There's no fake plants. There's mm -hmm. nothing there. And the reason why is because the, that stairwell is meant to prevent fire from getting any further. There's there's nothing to burn. Yeah. And a lot of that is because of these 1946 fires and the changes in the code. It changed like a, a fire door. It's a self-closing door. It's a heavy door. It's meant to be that way. And it, it says like doors to remain closed at all times. Um, all of that came out of this. And there used to be a big debate over whether existing hotels would be grandfathered in anytime the code was updated. And that was the, the custom of the land. And again, these 1946 hotel fires changed that. It was... If you have a hotel and you're doing business, you have to retroactively add a fire sprinkler system now. Yeah, and Truman, President Truman, the following year got involved uh, and specifically called for a national conference on fire prevention. So while, you know, I don't think there were any federal regulations, like you said, it was still mm -hmm. local. Uh, they did um, they did change a lot of the, like, national and federal building codes, at least. Yes, and, and I think it is still that way to this day. The lo it's localities that are responsible for fire codes, right? Yeah, and, and I think there's been ever since then an eye on design and safety, whereas back then it was just like, let's make this the most beautiful mm -hmm. uh, thing. I mean, I think in that first Chicago fire, didn't they even test the paneling and found that the oak paneling that they used was like five times more flammable? than just regular oak paneling because, they, you know, it was coated with this special thing to make it look pretty. Right. This, uh, like the veneer, I think, they use yeah. is really, really flammable. Uh, absolutely. Um, but there was uh, that, that MGM fire in 1980 that was so bad. It came decades after these reforms were made. I don't remember um, that. Was that Vegas? Yeah. It was a big deal. Like, there, it was on TV while it was happening, wow! Um, there's footage of like people in the higher um, floors, like like hanging out of their window and stuff. Um, and there were a lot of people in the hotel at the time. Eighty five people died. I think seven of those were hotel employees. Um, but it, and it could have been way way worse. But the reason it was as bad as it was, again, 119 is the worst hotel fire in American history. This was 85, so it was pretty close to, to yeah. as bad as it gets. But the reason why it was as bad as it was is because the uh, people who built the MGM Grand 
like balked at the cost of adding a sprinkler system when they built it. And the um, people in Vegas who were overseeing the fire code and enforcing it gave them a pass because they were just glad that the MGM Grand was building there. And uh, the, I think the fire sprinkler system would have cost less than $200,000 to build in, and they just didn't do it. That's until crazy a, for 1980. Until yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, that's 1930s stuff, not 1980s stuff. Look right above us, buddy. You see that little fire sprinkler? Yeah, I know. Now it's, like, cool to show your fire sprinklers, you know, and the piping and all that. <laughs> Forget your drop ceilings. Yeah. It's all about open floor plans, which, by the way, Chuck, I'm seeing more and more like of the um, the steady drumbeat against open floor plans is like the worst idea anyone's ever had as far as office spaces go. Oh, really? Yeah. How they're just attention killers. It's not like, I mean, you know that. Like, how often do I pester you and bother you? Just because I can, like, lean back and be like, hey, Chuck. And shoot a spitball. <laughs> right. <laughs> but they're so distracting, and I, I predict they're going to be gone in the next couple of years. Yeah, I don't know, man. Remember, like, back to the high cubes or offices? I think it's – I don't know. I have no prediction, actually. I was going to say I think it's just going to be more working from home, and probably it will, but I don't think we're done with offices yet. So I don't know what's coming next. I went in an, an office building uh, last week that had those really tall cubes that we used to be in back in the day. Uh-huh. And it was weird. It was like, man, I remember, I don't know, I didn't like it. There was something about someone poking their head above the wall. Gophering? Yeah, it, was that what it was called? I think so, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I never liked that. I prefer to see my enemies coming, so I think I like the open thing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, you did used to be a lot more jumpy with those high cubes. Oh, man, I hated them. Uh, well, you got anything else? Yeah, one more thing. Um, there's a very famous photograph from the Weinkauf fire uh, that won a young Georgia Tech student a Pulitzer Prize uh, in 1947. He was a Ph.D. student named Arnold Hardy, and uh, he was he lived kind of close by. He was on his way back from dancing, heard about this fire, called and found out where it is mm -hmm. because he fancied himself a, a you know kind of amateur photographer. Grabbed his camera, took a cab over there, and was the first photographer on the scene and took a very famous photo uh, of a 41-year-old secretary named Daisy McCumber in mid-fall uh, from this building. Um, you know, her, her dress is blown up and her, you know, 1940s uh, uh, pantaloons mm -hmm. are, uh, are showing, and uh, it's really a creepy picture. Um, he ended Did up selling the rights to the AP for 300 bucks. They tried to hire him. As a photographer, uh, you know, their Atlanta guy, and he refused. And um, apparently, too, and this is not well known, there was a drugstore across the street named Lane's mm -hmm. that was closed, and they needed supplies, like emergency medical supplies, and, and people were waiting on the owner to show up and open it. And Hardy himself kicked in the door, uh, ended up getting arrested for disorderly conduct, but the drugstore dropped the charges, uh, even though they made him pay for the door. <laughs> Which he paid for with his photo proceeds. <laughs> I guess, but it's uh, apparently they, uh, like at least in Atlanta, local police were then required to have medical supplies in their cars yeah. for the first time. And he always felt bad. Um, I don't know if this is still true, but as of a couple of years ago, his granddaughter uh, was a, worked at Twain's in Decatur. Oh, yeah. And she kind of kept his memory alive. He died in 2007 and said that he was always kind of conflicted that he got this recognition and this Pulitzer Prize from such a tragedy. So did did Daisy die? She lived. Okay. Although it was hard to find her because apparently, I don't know if it was because it was, you know, her underwear was showing, but, and it was the 1940s, she never oh, yeah. came out and was like, that's me. She would deny that it was her, but they eventually found out that it was Daisy McCumber, and she did live. Huh. Well, yeah. that's good. I'm yeah. glad she lived at least. It's very interesting. Uh, I've got one more thing. So with the Weinkauf Hotel fire, um, when they showed up, it was a one-alarm fire when they called. And I was like, what is that? What does that mean? And a, a one-alarm fire, a two-alarm fire, whatever. So apparently the alarm is the number of firefighters and equipment that are brought out. It's the number of units, right? Yeah, um, or the number of people. And it, it varies by municipality. So, for example, in like I found in Louisville, Kentucky, a one-alarm fire is 20 firefighters five trucks and two commanders. 
And then with each alarm, that number doubles, right? So when the the Atlanta Fire Department showed up on the scene, it was a one alarm fire. And it like right when they got there, the chief turned it into a two and then three alarm fire. And then within another 15 minutes, they turned it into a four alarm fire. And by with I think an hour or so after this fire had started, they were calling firefighters um, who were off duty from other cities. Basically, anyone who could get there fast enough and their fire truck came out to this to fight this fire. Wow, it was a big one. Uh, okay, and that's it. That's all I've got for hotel fires. I got nothing else. Well, if you want to know more about hotel fires, you can search those terms on the internet because I don't think How Stuff Works has anything about it. But that's okay because I said search bar, which means it's time for listener mail. Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to call this. Um, <laughs> Good job. <laughs> that's my Monica Sellis. Okay. Uh, I was listening to how board breaking works, guys, and you got into a conversation on women's tennis. And the shrieking and the yelling and wondering about Steffi Graf or Monica Sellis. Uh, you also mentioned Monica Sellis was stabbed. This is where my useless knowledge comes in, guys. Uh, most women tennis players do shriek. And I would personally, this is Chuck speaking, I think most men do too, right? Mm-hmm. I hear a lot of grunting. Sure. Uh, but he says Monica Sellis was the one that really had a very loud and high shriek. Mm-hmm. So loud, in fact, that many of her opponents would complain during the match and she would actually get warnings from the chair umpire. Uh, They would even measure how loud her shriek was. (laughs) I didn't know that. Yeah, that seems weird. Uh, Another interesting thing to me is that when Monica Sellis was stabbed in the back, uh, she was courtside, uh, uh, on the courtside change, resting in her chair. The person who stabbed her was not a fan. He was a Steffi Graf fan who was worried that Sellis would beat her record. Oh, my Uh, gosh. I know. Can you believe that? Did you see the uh, the movie about... um Oh, who who was it? Nancy Carey, Tanya Harding. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, I didn't realize that that had happened in tennis as well. Did you see that movie? Yeah, it was good, huh? It was. It was. It was very good. I was. I was surprised that she humanized Tanya Harding so well. <laughs> you know that was uh, local, locally made. No, that was obviously made in Oregon. <laughs> no, like the Golden Buddha Chinese restaurant in Decatur's there. Okay, yeah, I thought, I was like, is that is the Golden Buddha a chain? Because I think <laughs> I've eaten at that one. And Yeah, okay, you're right, I did notice that. And uh, we had quite a few of the old Stuff You Should Know crew members worked on it. Awesome. Yeah, it was cool. Uh, so anyway, back to the email. Monica Sellis was very young, just starting her career off, and Steffi had already been playing for a while. Uh, Monica had been on a tear and was starting to beat Steffi Graf. Because of the stabbing incident, the professional tennis tour increased security protocol. If you watch tennis on TV today, you will see that there are always security on the court during the changeovers. Uh, the security guard actually will stand behind the tennis player facing the crowd. And that is from uh, Raul Rodriguez in Topeka, Kansas. Nice. Thank you. Raul or Raul? R-A-U-L. Raul Rodriguez. Thank you. From Topeka, huh? Topeka, Kansas. Holding it down. Well, thanks a lot, Raul, and uh, everybody out there in Topeka, Kansas, for listening to us. And uh, wherever you are, you can hang out with us on the social medias. At uh, And by the way, I'm well aware that media is, medias is not the plural of medium. <laughs> no, that yes. media is plural itself. I'm just kidding. So yeah. lighten up. Someone said that, and I was like, uh, it was a joke, sir. Yeah. So uh, if you want to hang out with us on social medias... <laughs> now I'm just saying it out of spite. Um, you can go to stuffyoushouldknow.com, find all that stuff there, or you can send us an email to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com. 